It was over in less than a week. The self-styled provisional government of the Irish Republic surrendered and Britain executed 16 of its leaders. But the Easter Rising of 1916 changed the course of history. The failed rebellion and Britain's response to it brought an urgency to the demand for independence. The relationship between these islands would never be the same again. The First World War was underway. 200,000 Irish men were fighting in the British Army and taking heavy losses across Europe. No one anticipated an uprising at home. A lightly armed band had seized Dublin's General Post Office and declared Ireland an independent republic. Britain turned its military might on the Irish capital and crushed the rebellion in a few days. But Ireland's President Michael D Higgins says it was a founding moment for the nation. If they had lasted near enough to the, to the week, it's recognised as a revolution. But what it is, is a strike against empire. So I think let us all be honest. Uh, let us simply say uh, uh, um, it is from this moment that the movement towards independence uh, gathers force. There will be a terrible civil war. But it is from that our state has come. Having read their proclamation, they were forced to retreat to a row of houses on Moor Street. James Connolly was one of those leading the uprising. For his great-grandson James, these cobbled streets are sacred ground. We have here what is in effect the birthplace of the Republic, where volunteers made their last stand in 1916. So the 1916 rising effect effectively ended in this very area that we're standing in today. And most of the buildings that we have here, including the streets and laneways, are as they were in 1916. But there's nowhere more sacred to Irish Republicans than Kilmainham Jail. Leaders of the uprising spent their final hours in these cells. They seemed destined to become a footnote in history until Britain made a disastrous decision. 16 of them were executed, 14 by firing squad in the Stonebreakers yard here. It turned the tide of public opinion in Ireland. When the British ruthlessly came in and killed the, the leaders, they quite deliberately uh, took the head off their evolution. The thinkers and philosophers were removed. Obviously it was an armed rising, but it was more than that. You know, it, 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 it was at a time when the British had the largest empire in the history of humanity. This small group of men and women came together and, and said there was a better way of ordering our society. The proclamation would be read far and wide. The rising made the front page of the New York Times for 14 consecutive days, and part inspired the Russian Revolution a year later. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born, in the words of the poet. It was a, a, a rising of poets and artists and dramatists, and the whole idea of it being staged in the hope that the Irish would be able to get to the negotiation table to put their case for their independence. Um, I suppose it was aspirational and it was um, full of hope, but it was also a new generation. So many of the young people that were there were young and idealistic. Two years after the Easter Rising, Sinn Féin won a landslide victory. Ireland voted for the aims of the rebellion, a republic, rather than the home rule which had already been agreed. One former Irish Prime Minister says there was no need for an armed uprising. There's um, an ambivalence in this sense, in that people are saying, well, it's not justified to use the gun now, but we are going to justify its being used in the past. Now, in my view, it was wrong on both occasions. 1916 was unnecessary. We, would, we had home rule already. There was no need for violence. It didn't meet the criteria, the 1916 rebellion, of a just war. It was not necessary. In her historic state visit to Dublin, Britain's Queen honoured Ireland's dead. Her Majesty paid her respects to those who had taken part in the Easter Rising. But Northern Ireland's First Minister, the Democratic Unionist leader, won't be attending any commemoration. 
Well, I think the Queen is a beacon of reconciliation and she's been seen as such, uh, particularly in Northern Ireland, because of the way in which she has conducted herself there uh, for many years. For me, uh, as a unionist, as somebody who has lived through the troubles in Northern Ireland, where, frankly, the Easter Rising was used as a justification for the legitimacy of what actually occurred uh, during those 35 to 40 years, uh, it's something I don't see uh, as fitting of official commemoration. Uh, do I accept that it happened? Of course it happened, and it's very much part of what happened on this island, but I didn't see fit to commemorate it in an official way. 485 people died in the rebellion, most of them civilians. Nearly 1,600 were wounded. Was there an alternative to an armed uprising? Ireland's head of state says the events of Easter 1916 must be viewed in a wide context. Well, I think to understand the rising and the response to it, you have to uh, understand more than the nationalist tendencies that were being discussed all the time. Maybe the most challenging is to discuss the mind of empire. It is the, the character of the response to the rising um, the executions, the imprisonment, the huge building up of scale to crush the rising. The great significance of my, the, when I, with the state visit to the United Kingdom and my meeting with Queen Elizabeth, uh, was the atmosphere, which was wonderful in a way, because Her Majesty had uh, had uh, had uh, very clearly in her visit to Ireland um, struck a huge chord with the recognition that in respecting this complexity and difference is so important if we're uh, where we are, so that our present isn't in fact carrying any legacies of bitterness, and certainly so that the future we can embrace it together. There are those, of course who would fear that commemorating an armed rising is a dangerous thing to do in modern Ireland. What are your thoughts on that? I don't agree with this at all. Uh, the most useless thing, I think, is to affect some kind of amnesia. Uh, and amnesia wouldn't work. Uh, I remember uh, when I became president first, going to Northern Ireland, preparing my speeches, and I would regard it as amoral to actually say to somebody, you must put it all behind you. How can you? If you have a member of your family in a wheelchair, or somebody has lost a limb, or a loved one has been, been murdered or whatever. You, you really have to, uh, if you're involved in the ethics of memory, you have to transact it. So therefore you recognise it and you look at the complexity. And that's when you are, must be open to the different narratives that must be placed side by side. Police in Northern Ireland are concerned that dissident Republicans will seek to exploit the centenary. Detectives are already investigating the murder of a prison officer who was fatally wounded when a bomb exploded beneath his van in Belfast. There are people within dissident Republican groupings who want to mark the Easter 2016 100th anniversary in an entirely more sinister way, who want to kill police officers prison officers or soldiers. So we believe the threat is extremely high at the moment. It's at the upper end of severe and we need community support. Executed for the murder of a policeman in 1916, Thomas Kent was granted a state funeral last year. His remains had been exhumed from a prison in Cork. Right! Tanagy! Look! For some, the rebellion was a glorious episode in history. For others, the ingredients were far too toxic and incendiary to be commemorated. To some extent, that willingness or want to keep the violent tradition alive derives directly from the fact that we have overly celebrated the violent tradition in Irish politics. And the Irish state has, to an undue extent in my opinion, celebrated the violent tradition in Irish politics and downgraded the constitutional, peaceful achievements of home rule, land reform, the universities, the educational system, all those things that were done without the use of violence. Over time, the facts became blurred. The Easter Rising would be used by those attempting to legitimise violence. But Ireland is reclaiming its history to the pride of those whose families participated in the rebellion. 
I'm extremely proud because I believe that they they did something that they felt was good for everybody, not just for themselves, and they paid a huge price. There were a lot of different groups involved with slightly different agendas, but they all came together in that they wanted change. Relatives of the Rising are engaged in their own battle now. They are campaigning to have Moor Street protected. It's where their ancestors took their last stand, the men who were the first signatories to the proclamation of the Irish Republic where stands the Republic for which they gave their lives. I mean, I think the principles contained in the proclamation of the Republic, which they signed up to, are still very relevant to the issues that we face today. And we have an opportunity now in centenary year to reflect on that and to attempt to start out to build the sort of Republic for which they gave their lives. Dublin still bears the scars, among them a bullet hole in the breast of the angel on O'Connell Street. Ireland had to wait for independence, but one momentous week a hundred years ago would forever be etched on the collective memory of this nation. There will always be those who attempt to use the Easter Rising for political ends, even those who seek to justify violence. The challenge is to ensure that this commemoration becomes an impetus to peace. For despite the complexities of their shared history, there is a new relationship between Britain and Ireland. It may have taken the best part of a century, but things have changed, changed utterly.